<laughs> yes. All right, we are recording. Hello, everyone. Oh, let me let in one more person from the waiting room and uh, just hello again. Uh, welcome to yet another entry in the Professional Advancement Workshop Series or PAUSE. These workshops are not science seminars, but they are here to give you training to complement your scientific research skills. And today we are going to talk to a professional science journalist, Nadia Drake, and she's incredible. I think you will all have a great time hearing from her. Please make sure to ask lots of questions because she is um, she's here to talk to us and tell us all kinds of stories. We're going to have a great time. So let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Jessica Noviello, she, her. I'm the Nexus NASA Postdoctoral Management Program Fellow. And before we begin, I have a couple of details to go over. First, thank you so much to the NASA Astrobiology Program for sponsoring these events. And I specifically want to thank Mary Wojtek, Melissa Kirvin Brooks, and Sean Damogol Goldman for their time and effort spent on pause and their overall support. Second, because we are using Zoom for this meeting, please keep yourself on mute during the presentations. Uh, you are welcome to raise your hand and I will unmute you and then you can ask your questions of the speaker. We are also using Slido for uh, question organization. It's a lot easier than trying to follow the chat. So I'm going to drop the link in the chat in just a few moments and you can ask questions there if that makes you feel more comfortable. And finally, I'd like to remind everybody that there is a code of conduct in place for this and every pause session, and I will put the link to that in a, in the chat in just a moment. And these events, these events, excuse me, are meant to be for everyone to come and learn from each other. And if you ever feel like you need to report something or you just want to talk about an experience, feel free to reach out to me or to Melissa or Sean. We are here to help you as well as we can. All right, so I've already briefly introduced the speaker, and I do want to acknowledge that there are many people. Ah, this is this is a little tricky. Um, so I I fully believe in um, I fully believe in mental health, and I I will be honest and say that the past couple of months have been really rough for me. So things like the email snafu that happened yesterday where some of you didn't even get the original registration email. I'm sorry, that was that was me. And uh, while the speaker today is a phenomenal speaker and she should, I, I'm super excited that she answered my email. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there are many people in the astrobiology community like Mark Kaufman, who writes the Many Worlds column and Dr. Uh, there, there are just a lot of people who who do this as a career. And if you ask, if you are one of the, these people and you say, why wasn't I asked? It's not you. It was very much me just losing track of things. And and I mean you, no offense. I'm I am very sorry for the oversight. So I hope though that if if you are here, please feel free to speak up and and share some of your experiences. I Again, I, I don't mean to slight you. Um, this was this was this was my bad uh, to use a colloquialism. So um, yeah, just make sure everybody. Uh, I, I mean, it when I say I hope you're taking care of yourselves, especially now with the temperature so high. You make sure you are drinking water and resting as much as you can. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, and I'm going to yield the floor to our guest speaker, Dr. Nadia Drake. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Um, it's great to be here. I'm really excited about this. I wish that when I had um, been in graduate school and thinking about the next steps in my career that I didn't feel like I had to reinvent the wheel um, because there were no workshops like this that I could find easily. Um, so I put together just a couple of slides. I'm going to do the screen share. I'll make sure that this is working. Um, to introduce me and my story. Um, here we go. And are we seeing the slides now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so yeah, before before I dive in, um, I just want to echo what Jessica just said, which is, you know, a lot of people are um, science journalists, science writers, science communicators. We all arrived here in our own way, we took our own paths. Um, so what I'm gonna tell you is very much my own story. What I ended up doing worked well for me, but it's not probably um, the route that everybody wants to take. So um, 
this is me right now. I am the physics editor at Quantum Magazine. Um, that's an interim position that ends in February. Before that, I was a contributing writer at National Geographic. This is the first time I had to modify the slide in like eight years. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, but all right, so I like to say that I took the scenic route to um, science journalism. It certainly was not my first or second or even third idea about what I would be doing with my life. Uh, my first plan was to be a ballet dancer, and I had spent most of my youth training for that. I ended up going to college instead. And when I got to school, um, I couldn't decide what to major in, so I picked three majors. Um, I did a uh, triple major in biology, psychology, and dance, which is absolutely not something that I would ever recommend for anybody to do. Um, and at some point in there, I decided that when I graduated, I was going to go to law school and be an attorney. Um, that did not end up happening for a couple of reasons. And I pivoted and decided that I would go work in a lab and be a lab tech for a year or two and just dive into science because that's what my interests were at that point. So I applied to a couple of labs in different fields. Um, I ended up going to work at Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School in a cytogenetics lab because it was the field that I knew the least about. I thought that sounded really interesting. So I lived in Baltimore for two years. Um, while I was there, I thought, you know, I, maybe I should try graduate school. That seems to make sense at this point. So I applied to graduate schools um, in three different disciplines. I was looking at programs in neuroscience, in biochemistry, and in genetics, um, at this point, you should start to see a pattern emerging. <laughs> um, I eventually went back to Cornell where I'd done my undergrad because I found a project that would let me combine basically all of those things. There was a little bit of neuroscience, there was some physiology. Um, it was in an epigenetics lab. I thought epigenetics was really cool sounding and different and I didn't know anything about it. And it seemed like a good idea. And so um, obviously in retrospect, I would say that my kind of inability to ever really settle on a particular field or discipline, even early um, as an undergrad was probably an indication that going to graduate school might not have been the smartest idea for just the way that my brain works and the way that my interests tend to align or not as the case may be. Um, so while I was in graduate school, um, I was getting increasingly unhappy with it for a couple of reasons. One of them is that I was working with an animal model, did not really enjoy um, what that kind of research was like. But at some point in my second year, I was TAing, and I was realizing that I was just having a lot more fun um, talking about science, teaching science, um, you know, sharing the really cool stuff that that we were learning with classes. And that was that was just way more interesting for me than looking at how, um, you know, bands on a gel were running. Did my Western blot work? Do I have to troubleshoot it for the fifth or sixth or eighth time? Um, how many mice do I have to kill today and take their brains out? So I thought, OK, well, um, you know, that's an interesting data point. And. I think at that point I had actually, I was just talking with my parents and I was like, I kind of hate this and I don't know, I don't know what makes sense. And they said, oh, well, you know, there's a science writing program at UC Santa Cruz that sounds like it might be a really good fit for you. Um, and I grew up in Santa Cruz. That was where I lived. And I had no idea that not only was there a science writing program at UC Santa Cruz, but it's actually one of the very best in the country. And so I decided, all right, Science writing sounds like fun. Um, I'm going to do that. And I got in touch with the director of the program. Um, he said, you know what? I hear a lot of this, a lot of similar things from people who are scientists and everybody wants to apply and they think science writing is going to be great, but have you actually tried it? And I said, no, <laughs> I have exactly zero experience in this thing that I think is going to be really fun. And so he said, well, that's what I suspected. So what I tell people is that if they don't have any clips, um, they shouldn't even bother applying to the program. Luckily, you have a couple of years to play around. So why don't you go out, write some things, and then when you're ready to apply, then we'll look at it. And so that's what I did. Um, I was too stubborn to finish my PhD, to not finish my PhD. I decided I had to defend. I was going to get that degree, and then I was going to leave. <laughs> like as soon as I could, I was out of the lab. Um, and it surprisingly worked out. Um, everything worked, which was weird. And while I was in the program, or while I was in my um, PhD, I decided 
uh, I was going to do an internship with the Cornell University news office. So I did get some experience writing some news stories. They weren't exactly press releases. They weren't exactly totally independent news stories, but it did give me an idea for what that process was like. And um, that was really important. And I did learn that it was what I'd expected, that it was something that I was going to enjoy. And so I went to second graduate school um, at UC Santa Cruz. It's a year long science writing boot camp, basically. Um, it's an academic year long, so it's like nine months. And it was really hard. Um, even though I had decided that I loved science writing and that seemed like a good idea, um, I had to unlearn everything that I learned as a scientist about how to communicate because writing for the general public is basically the opposite of the way that scientists are trained to talk about their work. And some of my colleagues didn't have that trouble at all. They just kind of got right into the groove. Their first assignments were fantastic. It looked really easy for them. And I was getting assignments back with some of these comments, which I just think are kind of hilarious, especially the last one. When, when I finally got the one that said, ha, this doesn't actually suck. I was like, yes, like I have succeeded. I can retire now. It's never going to get better than this. Um, but that was kind of the point of the slide is that um, I feel like any time you're taking a step outside of your comfort zone, it is by definition going to be um, tricky and uncomfortable. And that's not the worst thing in the world. You can persevere. So um, after, well, even during that program, one of the things that they did was they threw us into school year internships um, even before the first day of classes started. And so they'd asked me, um, where, where would you be interested in interning? And I said, oh, I think, you know, let's try um, the local newspaper. I used to read the Santa Cruz Sentinel um, as a kid growing up. The idea of working for a newspaper completely terrified me because, you know, I wasn't good at meeting deadlines. Nobody in science is really that great at meeting deadlines, right? Wasn't that good at it. Didn't know how to write to word count. Had no skills as an interviewer. And I figured the newspaper was going to be the place where you learn that quickest. Um, and that was actually exactly the way that it worked. Um, by the time I showed up for our first day of class at UC Santa Cruz, I had a front page um, centerpiece story and I had the second section, they'd asked me to write a weather story. <laughs> My first day of work, they said, we need you to write a 400 word story about the weather this weekend. And I was stumped. <laughs> like I had no idea what to do. How do you write a story about the weather? And I asked one of the other reporters um, in the newsroom and she was really helpful. And <laughs> she said, well, first you should call up someone at the National Weather Service, talk to a weather forecaster, do an interview, see what they say. And I was like, okay. And then she said, and then go talk to Steven. Steven was another reporter. Ask him what the surf forecast is like, and then you can write that in there too. And so I ended up doing this 400 word story that involved doing the very scary thing of calling, cold calling someone and asking them a bunch of dumb questions, which was a very um, intimidating process for me as someone who'd never done an interview before to be um, feeling like I was really on the spot in an open newsroom where everybody can hear your conversation. So I took my cell phone and I went out to the parking lot <laughs> and called the weather service from the parking lot. So nobody could hear me being super awkward on the phone. It was awesome. Um, after that, my second internship was with the San Jose Mercury News, a bigger newspaper. Um, I discovered that I absolutely loved being in the newspaper newsrooms. The pace really worked for me. I loved the deadlines. Um, I loved being able to produce something and have it be done. Um, once you go home, it's off to the presses. You can't make any changes. And then it shows up on your doorstep the next day, or it used to before people stopped buying newspapers. Um, and then after that, I uh, did an a internship at Nature, which was a very different kind of science writing. Um, obviously, your readership for the Nature News section is not going to be the same as your general audience for a local newspaper. So that was a really good experience in terms of figuring out how to temper um, the level that you're writing at for different audiences. And then the program requires that after you graduate, you have a summer internship set up. And so I was lucky enough to find that at Science News in Washington, DC. And I showed up and they said, you know, um, our astronomy reporter just retired. Um, he'd been in that position for 20 years. It was the first time that position was open in two decades. And they said, 
we're going to ask you to write a lot of astronomy. How do you feel about that? <laughs> and I was like, well, let's see what happens. Because at that point, um, I'd written like two or three astronomy stories. I didn't really have, I had no academic background in it, except for like a class that I took in undergrad. Um, but I, I figured it was going to be a fun challenge. And so I did a lot of on the job learning. Um, I spent a lot of time going through the archive. I spent a lot of time looking up words <laughs> because I didn't know what anything meant. And then after about six weeks, they said, we would like to hire you as the new astronomy reporter. Would that be okay with you? And I said, that sounds fine. Um, so I was in that job for about a year, a year and a half. And then I wanted to move back to California because my partner at the time was in San Francisco. My family was out there. Um, I was feeling pretty lonely in DC. So I got in touch with Wired, which is based in San Francisco. And I said, is there any chance that you might need um, a staff writer? And they said, actually, our life sciences reporter is just leaving. So why don't we see if we can get you into that position? And I said, okay. Um, so a lot of serendipity here. And then I was at Wired for about two years. Um, <laughs> then they fired me, which is fun to say, because it rhymes, Wired fired me. Um, and that, at that point, I was like, well, all right. National Geographic had already asked me to start writing an astronomy blog post, um, like a weekly blog for them. I said, that sounds great. That's actually why Wired fired me, even though I was technically a freelancer at Wired. And I couldn't really do that, but whatever. Um, and once I started working for National Geographic, they said, uh, would you like to start doing news stories for us? How about magazine features? How about everything? So little book projects, um, working with the channel on some of some of the TV series that they're producing. Um, I just saw this sitting here. The magazine stories were really fun. Um, I was there for about eight years as a contributing writer. And then uh, you probably heard that National Geographic just laid off the vast majority of everybody who produces text for them. Um, so I got caught up in that too. And around the time that was happening, um, Quanta came along and said, hey, we're actually looking for someone to um, fill in for Natalie Walsh over while she's on book leave for a year. Does that sound like something you'd be interested in? I said, yes. <laughs> and so here I am, I'm editing. I'm doing something that is completely different than um, everything I've done up until now. So editing is, you know, the, the next, it's the, the, the different side of the editing writing coin. Um, so that wasn't really a very brief CV, but that's how I got here. And then just in terms of um, what I've generally covered, it's all of these things, astronomy, astrophysics, planetary science, astrobiology, human spaceflight, that's probably where um, I as a reporter put most of my effort. Um, as an editor now, the stories that we run at Quanta are really quite different than the ones that I was working on um, at both National Geographic and Wired and Science News to an extent. Um, so a lot more basic science, um, a lot more like pretty gnarly physics, um, you know, writing for an audience that's at a different level than even your National Geographic readership is. So um, I can stop there. I can keep going. <laughs> what, what would be best? How can I help you all the most? Well, we do have four questions already in our in our queue, and I can start with that. Okay. All right. Um, this one ties into what you already alluded to with with National Geographic, and the question is: How are journalists handling the uncertain standing slash future of platforms like Twitter or maybe mm -hmm. X? What is what is it called now? Um, are there institutional or freelancer plans to adopt other platforms? And I guess whatever you have to say on that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, obviously, there are a lot of things that are in flux with both the social media ecosystem and the science journalism ecosystem and journalism in general. I would say the last 10 years have not been very friendly <laughs> for journalism, for, um, you know, trust in reporting. And there's a reason for that. Um, yeah, the demise of Twitter, which we're just going to call it Twitter because I can't call it X. It's just not going to happen. Um, sorry. <laughs> Maybe someday. Um, that's a tough one. So I know that I and a lot of my colleagues are probably like most of you looking for a different landing pad. 
um, what is the best place to kind of port your social media personality over. Um, I've seen a lot of people on Mastodon, right? Probably like a lot of you as well. Mastodon, Blue Sky, I think is the one that people are feeling the best about at this point, although it's still in beta testing and you can't get in there without an invite. Um, Threads is the other one, major privacy issues with the way that that platform works. But I know that Quanta at least has already adopted a Thread account. So we have um, a presence there. Quanta has a presence on TikTok, which is very funny to me um, and is also posting on other platforms. But I think it's it's really just experimenting. And I'm personally just kind of sitting back and kind of waiting to see what happens before making a plunge, making the plunge into something wholesale. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that there is going to be a platform that is as useful as Twitter used to be. And that sucks, but I don't know what to do about it. If I did, it wouldn't be a problem because <laughs> we would have done it. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered the question at all. I think it was a very honest answer. And, and the question, the question asked about uncertainty and and I think acknowledging that uncertainty is an important part of of what we're all going through really yeah and I think um one of the things that I like to say in terms of you know if you're thinking about science communication and how to talk about science is that you can't you have to embrace uncertainty it's a part of doing science and so a lot of people it makes people uncomfortable uncertainty like we don't we as humans don't really like uncertainty um, but I don't think that we as journalists or we as scientists do ourselves any favors when we pretend like it doesn't exist, um, even in like observational results. You always want to talk about what you don't know, um, because that's where like the next really cool things probably are. So, yeah, I think acknowledging uncertainty on multiple axes is actually a really important thing. Oh, we have more questions coming in. I might, um, okay, I'm going to interject a question of my own. Out of all of the assignments that you have worked on and the places you've traveled, what is what is a story that connected most with you? Yeah, all right. Um, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing because I did, I did bring some photos. Um, so I have two answers to this question. Um, the first, oops, wrong screen. The first is over here. Um, these two photos on the right, I just threw these in here as a smattering of images representing, you know, recent things that I've covered. Uh, this is obviously, well, it's not obviously, this is SLS Artemis launch, um, which finally happened everybody's favorite giant space telescope, which I got to go see in French Guiana before it launched, which was amazing. Um, and then over here, we have some cave divers in Italy and we have me <laughs> on a snowmobile. I'm driving the snowmobile with a National Geographic photographer um, and that's up in the Arctic. And so those two images are part of a story that's publishing in the October issue of National Geographic that's looking at how we're looking for life on icy moons and the ways in which people are exploring analog environments here on earth. Um, and I absolutely just was so psyched to be able to do the story because it's something that I've been thinking about since I started my career as a science journalist. Like the very first story that I, feature story that I wrote for Science News was about looking for life on icy moons. Um, thinking about Europa, Enceladus and Titan, you know, which of those is the most promising? How would you even go about doing it? That was 10 years ago. 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago. And now we've got these missions that are finally on their way or, you know, in production that are that are going to these places. And it just seemed like a really, to me, this was a really fun story to do because it was like revisiting a topic that the first time I had thought about it, um, it just made me start asking all these questions that I haven't been able to stop asking. <laughs> And so now like I get a chance to go back and revisit them. And obviously the reporting for it was amazing. Um, getting to be in the Arctic for a month, um, going into caves in Italy, watching these divers do their thing, which I would never want to do. Um, but just thinking about, you know, how are we looking for life as we know it? How will we identify life as we don't know it? How do we even think about doing that? Um, 
you know, those are the kinds of questions that I really enjoy spending time on. So that, and then the other place that I've done a lot of reporting, which is completely unrelated to astronomy is um, the Peruvian Amazon. And I have just absolutely loved being in the jungle, um, discovering the jungle. To me, it's just the environment on earth that is just, it's erupting with life from everywhere. It's like life at its most profuse. Um, and it's just where I find myself being the happiest is in a situation like that. And so I've continued to look for excuses to go back. Um, I put these images here as examples of some of the stories I've done. I don't know if you can see my pointer, um, but if you if you look in the lower left, this is this thing that looks like a hand um, is actually a spider shaped um, decoy that this little tiny spider up on top has built in its web. And when people first saw it, they had no idea that you know spiders were sculptors that they could build shapes that actually resembled themselves which was a really weird thing to do and then and then you think about like why is this tiny spider trying to make itself look even more obvious it might not be the best survival strategy um so i love that story and i ended up reporting on it for like three years trying to figure out who these spiders are what they're doing um i went into uh some of the illegal gold mines in the jungle there to talk to miners and see why why they were doing this because i feel like We've all seen the reporting on how environmentally damaging um, gold mining is, and it is, it's terrible. It's absolutely horrific, the things it does to the environment. But nobody was talking to the miners about why is it that they are performing this work, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, it's very hazardous to their health. You know, what are the conditions that are forcing them to do that? And why do they keep coming back? And so that was the story that I did from there. And then we went into a very remote valley um, in very remote, far southeastern Peru. And we spent the night with a jaguar who came into our camp and just hung around, which is very weird. Um, I'd heard that because you know the valley is so remote, it's really tough to get into. Um, nobody really goes there, so the animals don't have any fear of humans there's they've never been hunted except for the fish um and so a couple of scientists had gone in and they said it's really cool because you'll be in kandamo and um, the monkeys will drop out of the trees to watch you make dinner and so i was ready for monkeys to show up and they did um, but i was not ready for this jaguar <laughs> to walk into our camp which she did and she she laid down she had a cat nap her like ears were twitching she was having dreams um we didn't know what to do about it. And when I got back out, I started asking around some of the people who study jaguars and other cats. And I said, is this weird? Uh, is this behavior weird? And they said, no, that's exactly what we would expect from a jaguar that has never encountered humans. We think they're incredibly docile. They don't care about you. They don't see you as prey. Um, and so that I ended up doing that story for the Atlantic about why it is that jaguars alone among their genus have that particular trait where all of the other cats that they share that genus with, lions, tigers, and leopards, will systematically hunt humans. Jaguars don't. Um, and then the last one here is a story I did about uncontacted tribes that were emerging along the riverbanks um, in the Amazon and some of, a lot of the issues that um, that brought up. And so I went into the local communities there and was interviewing people who'd been affected by um, the people's presence on the shore. There'd been a couple of murders um, and met this guy who had actually been born into the tribe that was re-emerging. And then he'd been kidnapped from that tribe as a kid and brought to live in this village. And he was really good friends with this kidnapper. And he could tell me all about what it was like to grow up um, in the tribe that was then re-emerging. Re and so that's the other place that is like the most near and dear to my heart. And I know that wasn't just one story, it was a lot, but um, you know, finding an area like that, which is so rich um, on like every level that you can imagine, um, that's been one of the very best parts of my job. Stop share. Sorry, I'm just, I'm kind of speechless from 
from all that you just shared with us, because that's not only a large variety of of topics, but deeply important topics as well. So I'm just taking a minute. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, all of that. Oh, I'm sorry I'm talking so long. No, no, no. It's it's incredible. I, I am enjoying listening to you. Maybe if you also feel that way, maybe put a thumbs up um, in the Zoom reaction so that we know that you are you're also. Ah, yes, we have an agreed. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Corinne. So um, let's move on to one more or a couple other questions then. Um, what specifically can we focus on uh, for science for the future and, and maybe in a more broad sense, how can we as scientists help science journalists like you? Um, I was actually hoping to ask you some questions along those lines. Um, I mean, I assume when you say what can we focus on as scientists, it's not scientific fields of study so much as how, how you talk about the science, is that right? Um, this was a contributed question. So if, if the person who wrote the, the question would is is on the call and, and wants to um, explain a bit more, then feel free to unmute yourself and, and join us, join our conversation. Otherwise, I'll have to just take my best guess. <laughs> no, it was me. Um, yeah, it was a scam question, actually, uh, and more hands on activity hmm. uh you know people were saying you know they don't want to be stuck in a classroom all day doing science so you know uh getting access to packets and uh, you know nice hands-on things that we could do in the um uh, outside in the outdoors or you know with water or any kind of project you might think of i think um so that's more of a question, I think, for like a science educator, which which I'm not, but I can tell you that um, I think you're on the right track, getting outside, um, you know, getting your hands dirty, actually doing some investigations. Those are the kinds of things that I think really resonate um, with students. One of the things that I've always really believed is true is that like kids are natural scientists. Um, they ask their own questions. <laughs> Sometimes they go and try and find the answers, which can be very amusing. Um, it would be nice to go up on the space uh, X, yeah. take a ride, you know, <laughs> go go check out the moon, wouldn't it? Um, I would do that. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think helping folks to you know have an experience where where they feel empowered in the pursuit of knowledge is probably the right way to go and. Um, you know, allowing everybody's natural curiosity about about the natural world, um, the way things work. Um, you know, giving that a place to thrive, I think is is going to be useful, but not easy. Nope. So, Gregory, uh, we have a chat comment for you, um, and Julia says that that she is a science educator. So if you'd like to chat, she's got some great resources for hands-on STEM learning. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Cause I just participated in this uh, conference and I got some good uh, STEM resources. Um, so appreciate it. I, can I just leave my information in the chat? Yes, or you can, um, Yep, Julia says yes. You can also just um, message her directly in the chat if you don't want everybody to see your contact info, but like whatever you prefer. So, um, okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. So, what else? I guess this, the second half of that question is again, how can we as scientists help you, mm -hmm. Nadia, and, and other people? How do we, um, like, what do you need from, from us? And, and maybe we can get a two way conversation going. Yeah, so actually, let me see if, I'm not sure if the slide is gonna be relevant, but we'll figure it out as we go along. Um, some SciComm tips that I put together for another presentation. Whoops, I didn't realize these were animated. Um, 
so I think <laughs> I usually want to ask scientists, like, what is it that you wish journalists knew about interviewing you? Um, and the question I usually get is, what do you wish scientists knew about the conversation that you're going to have with them? And I think aside from logistical things, like making us aware of when you have a result or, you know, bringing us along on a project, um, we've all figured out, I actually really love doing field reporting. I think it makes stories so much better, um, so much more context, characters, it's just, everything is great. So if somebody invites me to go into the field with them, I'm psyched. Um, but logistical things like that are kind of a different conversation. I think, and I kind of buried it in here, but um, the most important thing that scientists can do is to like be yourselves, <laughs> be actual humans. When you're talking about your work, turn yourself into a character, whoops, um, you know, tell a story. What does that even mean? <laughs> um, tell a story, make your science relatable. It's like so often we do interviews and I feel like the person on the other side of the table or the phone or the computer screen, um, I don't like doing interviews over email for this reason, is, is really hesitant to allow themselves to, to be a person, to have emotions, to have feelings, to um, not speak in, in scientist speak. And what I think works really well in stories, everybody loves stories, right? There's a reason that the narrative structure works. It's, there's a reason that humans have used narrative structures for millennia to share information, to remember information is because it's about characters. Um, it's about people who have, um, there's some kind of inflection point. And in science, I feel like they're, <laughs> science is so hard um, and it's so exciting and it's so beautiful. And when I talk with people, I wanna know what motivates them. Like, what are you concerned about? What are the questions that really bother you? Um, you know, how are you feeling as these data came in? How are you feeling as, you realized that this was what you'd been looking for, you know, after for 15 years, what was it like seeing those first images from JWST? You know, those kinds of emotional responses, I think are what really resonate with readers. And that's what you're going for. Long-winded, but be a character. <laughs> a wonderful answer. So um, along those, those lines then, then what is your process for finding stories and developing pitches? And do you have advice for those just starting just starting freelance science journalism when they're coming up with their ideas? Yeah, I'll go find one of my surprise animated slides. Um, yeah, so this varies a little bit um, depending on the type of story that you're looking for. So if you're starting out, you're probably thinking more um, new stories. So something that's highlighting a particular result or maybe an event um, like a rocket launch or you know, synthesizing a couple of papers, probably not thinking the longer magazine features, but we can talk about those too. Um, for new stories, there are a lot of ways to find them. Um, the most obvious are the journals where papers are published. And, um, you know, a lot of these journals, especially the ones with one name, um, they have embargoed tip sheets that go out to reporters a week ahead of time. So if you have a paper showing up, um, I will get an email with a list of papers that's coming out the next week with the embargoed information. And then I can decide if it's something that's newsworthy, does it fit um, the publication that I'm working for? And then if the answer is yes, we'll get going on that. So journals are great. Conferences are fantastic. Um, conferences are so good for finding new stories that are unique that nobody else is doing because everybody's getting these tip sheets. So that's why you see a lot of the same studies that are always being covered. Um, conferences though, you can go, you can listen to a talk, you can find a poster. Usually the posters are really great sources of information for new stories and you can have that scoop that nobody else has. Um, so that's usually when I'm at a conference, I'm not sitting in on the press briefings. I'm just kind of floating around looking for the secret stories um, or gathering future ideas. Um, press briefings, press releases are also great. 
Um, there's a logistical point there too for scientists, which I'm sure um, all of you are probably better at because I feel like NASA's press, press machine is pretty well oiled, but um, you know, making sure that your press officers are aware of results before they're published it makes them happy. Um, lab events, current or lab visits, tips, current events are a really big one now. I feel like <laughs> every story is a climate story, which is a science story. Um, so thinking about things that are happening in the news, um, current events, you know, again, like the rocket launches, that's a big one for um, human space flight because we don't generally publish papers about that, but there are a lot of papers that come out about the effects of space flight on human biology. Uh, the archive, you know, all of the, a lot of this is pretty self-explanatory, but if you just pay attention to what people are talking about, um, that's, that's a really good first step. And then in terms of um, starting out, so there are a couple of organizations that I would suggest um, either being a member of or um, following. One is the National Association of Science Writers, and they run a lot of workshops and mentoring programs um, that will link you up with a more senior science writer who's willing to work with you on pitching. Um, the Open Notebook is a fantastic resource. It's online, it's open. Um, pretty much any question you have about writing, reporting, um, anything related to the business, you can find at least one answer to there. And so I usually point people in that direction because it's just a phenomenally good resource. Um, AAAS runs a mass media fellowship program, which is amazing. Um, they'll put you in a newsroom for a summer uh, some of the folks that have come out of that program are astonishingly good. And every year at the AAAS meeting, there's an internship fair where um, they bring together, it's like three dozen different publications and you can just do interviews with the editors for each of those publications. You show up with your clips, your resume, and you talk to all of them. And so you can, you can practice pitching, you can make contacts. Um, they also have a mentorship program so those are the three that I would look into. So talking about um, doing interviews, so what qualities, this is like a, a slight two-part question, um, what qualities do you think are important for a career in science journalism? And then one specific question on any advice for becoming a field reporter. <laughs> um, Qualities that are important, uh, curiosity. Curiosity is a big one. Um, in general, I think the same qualities that make a good journalist make a good science journalist. Um, so, you know, again, curiosity, um, being able to write to word count and file your story on deadline. I don't know what kind of quality it would call that, um, reliability. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, the, I think the biggest challenge for a lot of science writers, and this is something that I'm seeing more as an editor now, is just tricky having having trouble describing concepts in a way that works for a lay reader. Um, I really, really struggled with this when I started the Santa Cruz program because um, I was very much still thinking like a scientist. I really struggle with it when I'm writing any stories about molecular biology or anything related to what I did my PhD in because I can't really see it through the lens of a lay reader. But I know that about myself and so I just kind of avoid covering those topics. But you really have to be able to put yourself in the position of somebody who's coming into the story that doesn't have all of the background knowledge. Um, and that's something that's it's hard for for veteran reporters too. But just being able to really think about what's important to communicate, um, you know, I had a thing on that slide that was up that said, "Don't be afraid of complexity, but just be able to simplify." Um, yeah, I don't know. That's not the best answer. <laughs> it's the first time I've gotten that question. <laughs> um, well, we get points for originality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In terms of becoming a field reporter, um, you just gotta go. Um, 
I don't know. Is the question more about how to find those opportunities or once you're in the field, how, how do you succeed at it? Um, Julia, do you want to, um, oh, finding the opportunities. Yeah. So those tend to come out of um, sustained relationships with research groups or scientists. So um, just like you would develop a good working relationship with any source that you're that you're working with, um, I found in most cases that the first time you call someone up, they're not going to invite you to come, you know, play in the field with them because they don't know who you are and they don't know your work and um, and it's a risk. But if you have a good working relationship with folks, you've covered their work. Um, they trust you, then, then those opportunities tend to come up. Or if you have a proven track record of that kind of um, assignment. So I mean, it's not for everybody. Field reporting, I love it. It's not the easiest, but it's great <laughs> for me. Thank you for that answer. Yes. Um, Oh, and Julia says thank you too. So I don't know um, what what everybody does or everybody who's in this room with us right now. I don't I don't know what you do, but yeah, field work is definitely something that many astrobiologists do. Um, there's a lot of work with. You have a background in molecular biology, and and you've talked about this. So yeah, I'm I wonder. Um, hey, anybody, if you want to have a field reporter come out with you, you know, just um, pick me, pick me. Yes. <laughs> so, all right, let's see. Okay, we have 12 minutes left and there are only three questions left. So I right. think we can actually finish. I'm good job, everyone. <laughs> so how about this question? Oh, this, this might be a tough question too. How do you think advancements in AI could influence the field of science journalism in the coming years? I like that it was phrased where influence could be both good or bad. <laughs> so I think um, most people tend to be concerned about, you know, bots replacing reporters. Um, I think wholesale, that's not gonna happen for the publications that we are probably paying attention to. Um, I have seen a lot of stories, it's really weird about the JWST Netflix documentary that look like they're written by bots. It's like the same story in triplicate on websites I've never heard about. And it's really weird. Um, but I think most people can tell the difference between something that's written by an AI and something that's written by a person, especially if they have any, you know, any amount of expertise in the field. What I have seen happening is uh, reporters using you know, chat GPT to generate the first draft of a pitch. And then they don't have to do that like work, but they can refine the pitch and turn it into something that actually works. Um, that's not my favorite, but I'm also pretty old school. And there's actually a lot of debates going on right now within and between publications about what's ethical when it comes to using AI. Um, where do you draw the line? And that goes for, you know, images, graphics as well. It's not just text. So the entire presentation of a story can be influenced by AI. Is that a good thing? In some cases, you can say, yeah, you know, using an AI to organize your notes. I use, you know, Otter to transcribe my interviews. Um, that saves me a lot of time. I'm really happy I don't have to go through and do it myself or, you know, pay somebody to do it because that would be a lot more expensive. Um, so I'm already using an AI in my work, but I don't think anybody would say that that's unethical. I think generating content is where you get into a gray area. But yeah, I, it's it's a really interesting question that we're going to have to see where it goes. And different publications have different ideas about what's permissible and what isn't. So it's evolving. Yeah. Oh, yeah, AI, big deal. Oh, we got a, a thank you from the chat. So, <laughs> I can probably be more helpful if you want. I just don't know like, where, where you want the discussion to be there. <laughs> I I have to say I'm I'm very hesitant about AI because I, I see I, I don't really know what to make of it myself. So I 
I think, again, a very honest answer about embracing that uncertainty of, of we don't know what the next step is. Yeah, we're gonna have to see how it plays out. Ooh. <laughs> All right, how about, how about a lighter question then? <laughs> what do you consider when, or what, yeah, what do you consider when thinking about whether a story is newsworthy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so the big things there, this is a slide, but I'm not gonna take the time to pull it up. Um, the first is, if it's a new story, then there needs to be some element of timeliness to it. Um, so, you know, why are we publishing the story now? And we call that a news peg or a news hook. It's something that you can hang the story on. And that's, that can be anything like a, you know, a publication, again, a current event, a conference presentation, um, you know, something that tells the reader why they should be focusing on this now, because everybody has such limited buckets of attention that you want to be able to tell people it's important for you to devote your limited resources to this now. Um, different publications have different ideas about what timeliness is. So like your local newspaper is probably, or, you know, your big newspapers, the Times, the Post, uh, they're probably not going to publish about an embargoed study if they miss the embargo and it's a week later. They're going to publish the story on the day that the embargo lifts. Other publications are a little bit looser. Um, so that varies by publication. Um, the other big thing is the importance of the result. So how significant is it? Um, so we're looking for timeliness and significance. And again, you know, that also varies by publication. The way the publications check all those boxes is different based largely on, on who the readership is. So you're gonna get different decisions about stories at National Geographic and Wired, Nat Geo and the New York Times are pretty aligned. I tend to think that they, they run similar stories um, Quanta, where I am now, is like totally off on its own, <laughs> doing doing its own thing. Um, although we do run breaking news stories as well. But yeah, timeliness, significance, um, what's the quality of the work? We don't want to publish stories about crappy science, but, you know, unfortunately, we do end up having to publish debunkers about science that is crappy that's been covered, but covered credulously. Um, yeah. So that's a third category of story. <laughs> yeah, that's that's those are the two big things. Ah, all right. Last question. Since you have had and always had multiple interests and skill sets, do you know of any successful research scientists slash science writers? So maybe people, maybe like who are your other? Who are some of your favorite science writers? Ooh, who are some of my favorite science writers? Huh. Um, I mm, am a little hesitant to call out specific colleagues because I feel like if I forget someone or I don't mention them, then it's going to be bad. <laughs> Um, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I will say, let me see how I can do this. I probably shouldn't say anything. Um, I'm trying to think of there's a way I can do this. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for the last question to be such a, a, a tricky one. Um, but yes, there are very, there, there are quite a few wonderful, uh, science writers and, uh, they all have, their perspectives that are very that are very good and we are glad that they are doing this work <laughs> yeah that's true I, I i'll say like some people excel at certain parts of the job and some people are better at other parts um one of the questions that i was asked really early in my career by the first editor-in-chief i worked for at science news was do you think you're a better writer or a better reporter so are you better at gathering the information or are you better at putting it all together? And that's something that I think about pretty much every day because I think it, it varies by story for me. I tend to flip-flop. Um, there are some science writers who are incredible reporters who are so good at getting information, um, who are so stubborn and they just go for it. 
but they're not always the best writers. And there are others who write the most beautifully lyrical, evocative, descriptive prose, um, but you can tell the reporting is them. And then there are people who put all of those things together and they rock. <laughs> so yeah, I think um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I think we're all consumers of news stories and it's important when you're reading a news story to consider you know where is the information coming from um, how trustworthy is it has this reporter actually done their job in gathering the information if it's a story about um, a study do they have a comment from someone who's providing an outside perspective on the work or have they only talked to the team members who are going to be like yeah our work is awesome and they don't have that perspective from someone who can come in and, and put it in context. I mean, that kind of thing, that's what I think is really important as consumers of news to think about um, as you're looking at a story. That was very well said. Thank you. <laughs> Let's pivot. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, again, and I've said this before, the worst part of, of doing these conversations is that eventually they have to end. And I do believe we're at that point, but um, amazingly, we made it through every single question. So well done everybody for asking questions. Please join me in thanking our speaker one more time for her time, her experience, and, and just for sharing with us today. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, do you have any final thoughts to to share with us in the last minute? I would say rock on. Um, get in touch anytime if you want to chat. I am here. So yeah, absolutely. Be in touch. Wonderful. Yes, we're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. And uh, Corinne specifically appreciates the um, embracing of uncertainty and, and that it's been a theme in this talk. So just... Thank you everyone for joining us. Please uh, keep a lookout for the next emails for the next events. And oh, just again, thank you so much for, for spending an hour with us. It was so wonderful to meet you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Stay cool, drink water, and have a good weekend. <laughs> Bye.